Hey everyone, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today we're talking about the spirit of Leviathan. Is it a thing? Well, today we're going to be looking at some biblical uh, verses, biblical verses, the only kinds of verses that we look at here on this show, the ones in the Bible. <laughs> it's going to be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Jamming out to some music. We've got a great episode for you today, guys. We're going to be covering lots of stuff. Uh, our beliefs on demons and demonology. What is a Leviathan in the Bible? Uh, what do some charismatics teach about this? We're going to talk about the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Uh, and uh, then at the end, we're going to ask, how do we engage with principalities and powers? It's going to be an exciting program. Uh, but I do want to remind you guys that we're entirely crowdfunded. So if you've been blessed by this episode or other episodes we've done, check out links in the description of this video. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal or you can be a reoccurring giver there on Patreon. Give as low as five bucks a month. You get access to extra content. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to my good friend Michael over there in the wonderful world of Oklahoma. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, live from Oklahoma. Hey, guys. Yeah, doing good, man. Doing good. Hey, and I also want to add, make sure that you hit that subscribe button so you can continue to get great content just like this. Uh, last week, we talked about the Jezebel spirit. This Jezebel. week, it's Le Jesse B. This week it's Leviathan. We need what's the what's the nickname for it, Josh? I've got no nickname for Leviathan. You got no got you got no nickname. I thought you were gonna throw like a your mom joke, like your mom's Leviathan. Oh, like Michael oh. Miller, since he's not here with us today, yeah, unfortunately. Boy. Yeah. His <laughs> name, the running name but, for Leviathan. <laughs> but next week we have the Python spirit. So uh, we were going to do two in one episode. That's kind of how we originally said it. But there's so much on Leviathan in the Bible. We got to just focus a whole episode on this, Josh. So I agree. Yeah. So so let's talk about it. First of all, we'll, we'll begin on just like demons and demonology. And let us be clear out from the gate because we've seen other people have done videos on Leviathan spirit and and uh, some discernment ministries, and they said, oh, all the Pentecostals and Charismatics, they're crazy and they're stupid because, you know, the real problem isn't the spirit. The real problem is the wickedness of the human heart and, you know, things to that effect. And, and we would say the human heart is a big problem. Jeremiah 17, who can understand it? It's so wicked above all things, okay? So, yes, the human heart is a problem, but as it turns out, demons are a problem too. And there is such a thing as spiritual warfare. And what we're trying to sift through is the fact that in charismatic culture, there are a lot of demon names put out there. Leviathan is one of them. Python spirit is one of them. And the Jezebel spirit is one of them. And there are others. In fact, if you want us to do more episodes, just put it right here in the chat. Let us know. We'll do a little research and Maybe there's some charismatic demons we've never heard of that we need to do shows on. But those are the three that we're planning on. So uh, my favorite anyway, thing so about that spiel, how... my absolute favorite thing was that you pointed to the side of the screen that literally nothing is on. And there's nothing I, over there's there. There's nothing on that side of the but screen. But on my screen, it's over I'll, there. I'm sure it so... is on your screen. <laughs> Thanks okay, that. so we've done tons of videos on demonology. We believe in demons. We believe in casting out demons. We practice this sort of thing. We've got an entire playlist on our channel where you can go through where we talk about how demons get in, uh, uh, how to cast demons out, that kind of thing. Uh, I think we've done eight or nine videos. Maybe we've done up to 12 videos. Lots of stuff that we've done. We answered questions. We did Q&As. Tons and tons of content on demons. So we believe in this stuff. But we also realize, like Michael said, that there is this reality where... Um, charismatics will say someone's wrestling with this kind of spirit and then they slap a name on it that they found in the Bible and then they give it certain attributes and they're like, hey, you know, I cast out a demon and it told me its name was Leviathan. And you go, well, you know, demons are actually known for lying to people. Actually, that's kind of a marker of characteristic in 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 the scriptures. Is it possible that they're spouting lies so that we create certain kinds of mythology around them, uh, cause us to to, to be led into unbiblical practices of speculation, at least possible. So today, we're going to kind of try to do a bit of discernment in sifting through this. Uh, I'll be honest, 
when I started this study, uh, I was coming to this going, this is going to for sure be a, like a Jezebel situation where Jezebel is a lady. It's clearly a lady. Nowhere in the scriptures is she called this spirit. Why are we calling this a Jezebel spirit? Sure, there might be a spirit of sexual immorality, uh, but I don't think there's a Jezebel spirit. Uh, how does that work? Well, as I'm studying this, I assumed this was going to happen in the exact same way, but it does seem as if there may be evidence that points to the contrary. Uh, so there now that we've be, gotten off. But we're going to look. We'll we're see. We're going to look. Uh, so we said, okay, this is where we, we believe at demonology. Michael, do you want to get us into what the Bible says about the Leviathan spirit? Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll look in uh, some verses that mention the word Leviathan. Now, the words Leviathan spirit are never in the Bible. But the word Leviathan actually uh, comes from Canaanite mythology. And the biblical writers will adopt this. And so the Leviathan was thought to be this mythical sea creature. And uh, and so the biblical authors will sometimes reference this mythical sea creature. And, and sometimes, in, in, in fact, even in the creation story, let's, uh, let's take this. The word Leviathan isn't found in the creation story, but you do have uh, a polemic. That's sort of like an attack uh, against the uh, uh, the different gods. It's, In this case, it would be the Babylonian gods. Go, it's first century. It's first century trash talk, right? Like it's, you're yeah. you're you know a reference that everyone has in their mind. Like if I if I told Michael, you know you know, something about a hammer that was unmovable and, um, you know, hair that was long gold. Like the, I have this enemy, Michael, that I'm fighting and he has long golden hair and a hammer that can, he can only lift, but I am greater than he and I can lift his hammer at will. Everyone has in their mind the idea of Thor because of Marvel films, right? Like for sure, it, it's, we're speaking in a sort of smack talk uh, saying I am greater than th this ancient Near Eastern creature. Right. So uh, in the creation story for the Babylonians, for instance, you had uh, Tiamat and Marduk. And Marduk was the great god of the Babylonians. And uh, Marduk and Tiamat, they're fighting against each other. And and Marduk actually almost loses. And Tiamat is uh, is sort of this like chaos god. And, uh, and, and what ends up happening is Marduk slices Tiamat in half and comes out on top. And so you can see in the creation story, the, the fact, and, and by the way, Tiamat is, is associated with the sea, the waters of chaos, because in ancient times, the waters represented just this untamed, uninhabitable evil and chaos. And so you, uh, and so you, you see in the Genesis story, you have the primordial waters and the chaos and God actually divides the waters. It actually kind of reminds us of this sort of Babylonian myth. And it's sort of like the biblical biblical author saying like, hey, Yahweh is so far above it. Unlike Marduk, he doesn't almost die. Uh, he doesn't like, you know, have to battle it out. He just speaks the words and the waters are tamed. And so, uh, but that's important because that word Tiamat is connected to the word Leviathan. You want to speak into that a little bit, Josh? Well, I mean, I, I want to definitely make sure that there is a connection for everyone who's watching that waters is chaos imagery throughout the Bible. The idea that God can still the waters, God can calm the waters, Jesus calms the storms, Jesus walks on the waters, the rough uh, uh, sea, you know, uh, the beast in Revelation comes out of the water throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. The waters is chaos imagery, which makes perfect sense if you live in the first century and you have to live by the water water so that one, the water gives you agriculture, uh, and two, you can go out and fish, get some protein in uh, the sea. But the thing about the sea is a storm could kick up at a moment's notice, and it could kill you. You could be there on the land, and tides come in, it floods out your house. So the water was an unpredictable thing that gave life. And in any ancient Near Eastern culture, you're like, hey, this thing gives life and death. It must be a god. Uh, even in Egyptian cultures, the Nile in particular uh, was a, a place of chaos imagery. It's blessing and cursing. And in fact, the Pharaoh was supposedly to be the one who was able to reign over the Nile and cause the seasons to uh, to rotate. He would he would be the guy who would say, hey, uh, I have blessed the seas. And now uh, it's that time of year when the, the Nile will overflow and harvest and uh, water your harvest fields, right? Uh, you'll find that in times of up, 
upheaval in Egyptian culture where we're not really sure who the Pharaoh was and, and there was kind of civil war or whatever. It was in times of drought uh, because, hey, if the guy on top is supposed to be uh, causing our crops to be hard, uh, 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 fertile because of the water, and he is unable to do that, he must not be the rightful pharaoh. So people would come in and usurp authority. So again, it wasn't just in you know, Christian culture, it's not even in biblical culture, but throughout all ancient Near Eastern cultures, whether it be Canaanite, Babylonian, Christian, uh, Christians in ancient Near Eastern, but um, throughout all of these cultures, the imagery of water being chaos imagery is just, you know, rife throughout all of the scriptures. Um, I thought that was worthy of saying. Uh, I, yeah. I, I totally did not uh, answer your question, Michael. I honestly yeah. don't remember what it was. <laughs> okay. But well, since hey, I monologued, let me just toss actually, it back to you. <laughs> why don't we actually dive in? Because I want to get to some uh, some texts that actually mention uh, Leviathan or uh, dragon, uh, which those will be mentioned in, in pl close proximity here. But Ezekiel 29 is an important text. So uh, I'm going to read this, Josh, and then you can uh, maybe comment on why this is relevant for our discussion, okay? okay. Uh, Ezekiel 29, 1 to 5, it says, In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his streams. It says, my Nile is my own. I made it for myself. I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your streams stick to your scales. And I will draw you up out of the midst of your streams with all fish of your streams that stick to your scales. And I will cast you out into the wilderness, you and all the fish of your streams. You'll fall in the open field and not be brought, uh, brought together or gathered to the beasts of the earth and to the birds of the heavens. I will give you as food. Okay. Now, somebody's probably saying, Josh, this doesn't mention Leviathan. It mentions dragon can you speak into that for a second oh but wait does it uh pharaoh king of egypt the great dragon uh dr michael heiser says um uh, i'm just going to give you a couple quotes from him the reference to pharaoh being uh, referred to as a great dragon the hebrew word lurking behind the english word dragon there is uh tanin it comes from uh layman tanin uh, but you have uh, a very clear uh, mythopoetic bent in Ezekiel 28 that says, uh, hey, we're talking about a historical figure here, that's Pharaoh, um, but lurking in the backgrounds are these religious theological things uh, that have to do with divine counsel and cosmic rebellion and all that stuff. Uh, other pagans, uh, uh, I'm sorry, other passages where uh, the great dragon or Leviathan, who is called Tanin, is going to be discussed. A Leviathan is perhaps the most well-known cosmic symbol in 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 antiquity. So, guys, you you get to hear about Leviathan and you get a demonstration of tongues. So, uh, here in uh, uh, just kidding, here in Ezekiel 29, uh, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon. Uh, the word dragon there is the word tanin. Uh, it's the word that is uh, often associated with. Uh, 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 Leviathan, Leviathan, who is called Tanin. We see that in the scriptures. So uh, there is a connection here, and he is making a clear imagery like we, we saw when we interviewed Matt Chandler. Um, there is, in the book of Revelation, real beasts that represent real nations. But behind those real nations are these spiritual principalities and powers. Uh, we see this often when we talk about the king of Tyre. Everyone assumes that the king of Tyre is a real earthly king, but many scholars believe believe that there's an actual principality behind the king. Um, there's passages where uh, we, we talk about kings and princes, but, but it says things like, you were in the garden. Uh, you were this blessed cherub of the garden. You had precious stones on your chest. Mm -hmm. Like, what king was in the garden? H how obtuse is this passage? But it seems as if there's a common correlation to speaking to earthly kings and then speaking to the spirit that's behind or leading or dragging that king along. Right. Michael well, Taggart. It's relevant. It's relevant that the passage you're talking about with the king of Tyre occurs in Ezekiel 28. And um, it might be the majority of scholars, uh, at least the majority of pastors I talk to, believe that this reference to the king of Tyre, as you were just saying, Josh, is actually talking about not just the king of Tyre, but also Satan. Okay. And uh, in the same way, that it's that the same passage speaks of a king and of the supernatural power behind it. We get just one chapter over in Ezekiel 29, 
where Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is called the great dragon, which you just talked about associated with the Leviathan. And, uh, and some scholars will say, well, this dragon is just a symbol of Pharaoh. And that's certainly true. But the, the key, the question is, is it just a symbol or could it be like in the prior chapter where we see there's a supernatural and a natural element? Could it be something like that where there's this dragon or Leviathan, this sort of demonic entity empowering Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and the two are sort of bleeding into one? I think that's kind of what you're getting at, Josh. 100%. And and uh, the two, the fact that Ezekiel 28 and 29 are right beside each other could strengthen that case. Yeah, let me read this other quote, and I'll let uh, uh, Michael read this quote from the Psalms. But here uh, in Ezekiel 29, 4, he says, I will put a hook in your jaw. Again, a quote from Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, what's the point uh, that God is making? Uh, he's making fun of Egypt here, calling her uh, Rahab, who sits still, uh, because he's saying you don't have the power to do anything. You're not a threat. Uh, you you might as well just sit on your butt over there in the corner because you're not doing anything. That sounds no, so not scholarly. <laughs> yeah, it was during a podcast. Uh, it yeah. wasn't in written form. Uh, you're sort of a... a, 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 a you're, you're, you're sort of useless. You're uh, unimportant. The idea is you're not active. So basically, you're not a force more to be trash reckoned talk, with. More yes. trash talk about Rahab. What it's really Bob. important, though, is that that, that jaw, that, that hook in your jaw uh, thinking, that's going to come up in a lot of passages talking about Leviathan, this idea of him being hooked and controlled. Because God is saying, I can control this thing, but you'll see later, nobody else can. Uh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, okay, so then there's uh, Psalm 89, and uh, and here's what it says. It says, Let the heavens praise your, uh, praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings, uh, the Ben Elohim, the sons of God, who among the sons of God is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him? Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord, with all your uh, your faith, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging sea. Okay, so a couple of elements we see all at once. And Josh, in a second, I'm going to ask you to unpack this divine council worldview, as Heiser sure. talks about. Okay, but uh, first of all, we have this label, the sons of God, the Ben Elohim. Okay. Uh, so we'll need to talk about that. Uh, it also has reference to you rule the raging sea. So we have a connection between the sons of God and the ruling over the raging sea. And then we have Yahweh above them all, ab above the sons of God, whatever these are. Jo Josh, I'll let you explain that. And above the raging sea, which is associated with chaos and evil. So Josh, help us connect the links in this passage. Cool. Yeah. Uh, the the Ben Elohim. What's the Deuteronomy 32 worldview? I'm pulling a lot from Heiser today uh, because if we're going to make sense of this at all, he's done a ton of scholarship to make this accessible to lay people like myself. Uh, and uh, I find his material pretty insightful. I don't agree with 100% of his stuff. I think there's a few passages in Genesis that he points to as uh, Ben Elohim passages and not Trinitarian passages that all the church fathers would say, that's about the Trinity. Um, so, so there are a few things that I might like disagree on, like on minor issues. But generally speaking, this makes a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, first of all, the Bible speaks of God uh, as this God of the universe who's the creator of all things and everyone. There's only one. There's never been one before him. There's never been one after him. This is what Isaiah tells us. Uh, and he has these divine attributes that no one else shares. He's all present. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. Uh, however, there's another group of beings that are also attributed to the name God. Uh, they use the word Elohims. Uh, you'll see this in Exodus chapter 18. 11. Uh, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because he is, uh, uh, because in this affair, he dealt dealt arrogantly with those people. Uh, in Psalm 97, 9, uh, for you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. At 95, 3, uh, for the Lord is uh, God, a great king above all gods. Uh, uh, Psalm 135, 5, uh, for I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. So over and over, we see that there's only one God. There's never been one before him. There's never one after him. And yet the Bible refers to gods. And he says that 
that, that our God, the creator of everything, is greater than these other Elohim. So what does that mean? It seems as if there's a species difference between the creator of the universe and these other spiritual beings who do seem to rule and reign. Uh, the idea is that these are the Ben Elohim, or the sons of God, seen in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis 6, we see the sons of God come down to, to have relationships with the daughters of men, and in those days, the Nephilim are born. We've done videos on that. Uh, whether these Nephilim are actually human angel hybrids uh, is an entirely different question. I honestly haven't made up my mind on it, uh, but it's clear that the sons of God are angels. Uh, and we see in Deuteronomy 32 that he divided the nations according to the number of the sons of God. Now, there is a, a textual variant here, I think in the Masoretic text, it says the sons of Israel, uh, but that doesn't really make sense in Deuteronomy 32 since Israel wasn't a nation at that point. Uh, the, the, the nations hadn't been numbered at the division. Uh, when God divided the nations, he numbered them according at to the, the sons of, of God yeah. at the Tower of Battle, not at the point of Deuteronomy 32. So you have like the prince of Persia over Persia that this angel comes and fights uh, when he comes to deliver a message to Daniel. And, and, and the angel Gabriel's like, hey, when you started praying, I was sent uh, with a message, but the prince of Persia resisted me. Michael was sent. We, we conquered the prince of Persia, and I've come to deliver this message to you. So if he's a prince that's ruling a certain region, it seems as if he's one of these Elohim sent over a nation. And then what Michael just quoted in Psalm 82 is that God reigns supreme among this divine council, these Ben Elohims. Uh, that's the, the word that's used in the divine council passage in Psalm uh, 82. Uh, he rules supreme above them uh, because they've gone far off. He said, I say that you are gods, but you're going to die like men. Um, and his feet are on that chaos imagery. So we're beginning to see a pattern form and emerge. And I think the question we need to be asking is Leviathan, one of these Ben Elohim, is he a son of God? Is he some kind of angelic being that rules and reigns in the heavenly places that is in divine, re divine rebellion, is in rebellion against the God creator of the universe? <sighs> yeah, absolutely. What a rant. So, man, dude, that was good, bro. Words. That was Words. good. You you got that you got that spiel down. Trying. So, so just to again to be really clear about why we put this background in here is because the word leviathan. I mean, some people will try to try to say, well, the leviathan. It sounds like a crocodile. It sounds like a hippopotamus. Some people will say, and they'll read Job forty one, and we'll get to that one in a second, and we'll. Well, Leviathan is, maybe it was a dinosaur, and dinosaurs were around, and young earth, and all of this. And, but we have to come to the Bible in the same way that somebody living in the ancient Near East would have come to the Bible. And when they would have saw, saw the word, when they would have seen the word Leviathan, they would have been thinking about the foreign god of the ancient Near East that went by that name. And so what we're saying is, since there was a foreign god, not Yahweh, that went by that name, and since the Israelite worldview was that all other lowercase g gods were actually demon principalities, what we're saying is, it's worth asking the question, could it be that Leviathan was actually viewed as one of these overruling principalities? Uh, Josh, am I... Am I catching what you're trying to say here? You're on mute. Every time. Uh, he says uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, you're offering up uh, food to idols, but they're not idols. They're actually demons. So we have a precedent in the scriptures where people are worshiping these false gods. They, they're worshiping yeah. these created things, but there's demonic powers that are inspiring this worship. There are demonic powers yeah. that are hiding behind those veils. So if uh, there was a sea creature in mythology that was feared and or worshipped named Leviathan, it's at least plausible. And again, we need to be careful in saying that for sure Leviathan is a son of God, and for sure he is a ruling and reigning power, and he has for sure got these specific attributes. I, I want to speak in terms of, I think it's plausible, and I think the text of Scripture kind of allude to something like this. Uh, and it could be just poetic literature. It could just be speaking in metaphor in a polemic, like Michael was speaking of earlier. Uh, I can speak of Thor, but Thor not be a real person or a real spirit for that matter. So we can't be precise where the Bible is not precise, but I think that we can tend and lean in an area that I think the Bible kind of leans into. Yeah. Yeah. So... 
there are a couple of more passages, Josh, that we're going to need to look at to really assess what the Leviathan is. Because Job 41 is one that people commonly go to to say that the Leviathan is an earthly creature. It's an actual, like, it, it either existed long ago or it exists today. It's a crocodile, it's a hippo, it's a dinosaur, whatever. Uh, why don't we read through Job 41? Um, do you want me to read it now or... I, I'm trying to remember. Did, did I can, you I can, a, didn't you have it recorded or something? I do. We can play through it real quick. Because yeah, let's do that. it's a long verse, guys. It's a long chapter. Yeah. So here we go. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you uh, soft words? Will Sorry, he guys. It says Job 40. It's Job 41. Servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird or will you put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle? You will not do it again. Behold, the hope of a man is false. He is laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not keep silent concerning his limbs or his mighty strength or his godly frame. Who can strip off his outer garment? Who could come near him with a bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? Round his teeth is terror. His back is made of rows of shields shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. His sneezing flashes forth lightning and his eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go flaming torches, sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils comes forth smoke as from a billowing pot and burning rushes. Out of his mouth go flaming torches, sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils come forth smoke, as from a billowing pot, burning rushes. Uh, his breath kindles coals, and a flame comes from his mouth. In his neck abides strength, and terror dances before him. The folds of his flesh stick together, firmly cast on him and immovable. His heart is hard as stone, hard as a lower millstone. Uh, when he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. At the crashing, they are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches him, it does not avail, nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. He counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. For him, slinging stones are turned to stubble. Clubs are counted as a stubble. He laughs at the rattles of javelin. His underparts are like sharp hot shards. He spreads himself like a threshing sledge or the mire. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him, he leaves a shining wake. One would think the deep to be white-haired. On earth, there is not his like, a creature without fear. He sees everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. Okay, so here's the verse. Uh, sorry, I think that one of those verses might have been read twice, and I think that that verse, that was Job 41. That was not Job 40, guys, so I apologize that that was uh, uh, misspelled. It happens. Anyway, right. um, let's let's dive into this. What are some passages in here, Michael, that you look to and you go, okay, I can see the argument for sea creature, or I can see the argument for crocodile slash hippo. Uh, what would be your take on yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it talks about his neck. It talks about his face. It talks... Talks about his back, his scales. I mean, even talks about his underparts. I mean, are we really going to say, Josh, that principalities have underparts? I mean, I'm trying to find a joke. Um, <laughs> you weren't holy, ready for that. Holy anymore. underwear? Is that what that means? No, okay. Um, I, I don't <laughs> you know. You weren't I got ready for that at all, were you? I got nothing. No, yeah. so when it, when we look at this passage, it do, there there is an argument made by many scholars. I would say, would you say a majority of the scholars that wants to make this yeah, a, a I, natural reading? Uh, I would say the majority that I've read, yes. Okay, yeah, and I would think that the majority that I've read would say maybe dinosaur, maybe hippo, maybe crocodile. Mm -hmm. Like, but but there are a few things that I just I don't think work for crocodile. I mean, even in Job's day, spears can't pierce him, clubs can't hurt him. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, the crocodile. Uh, 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 what's his name? The guy got stabbed through the heart. What's his name? You know what I'm talking about? The, oh, uh, the wrestler, Croc Hunter. Croc Hunter. Yeah, I forget his name is. Yeah, I anyway, forgot too. Anyway, so this this dude this dude goes out there and and wrestles crocodiles and and I you know a harpoon would for sure cut into a crocodile right an arrow would for sure like go into a crocodile uh, air goes in between their scales their scales aren't impenetrable uh, they don't spit fire uh, I don't know of a hippo that spits fire now hippos are dangerous little creatures I mean there are videos of them taking on massive animals and winning um, so so I don't mean to say that. It's impossible for it to be an alligator or impossible for it to be a hippo, and it's being spoken of allegorically. But there are a few things in here that kind of draw my attention away from that, okay? First of all, 
Uh, that verse, uh, verse one, draw out Leviathan with a fish hook. That's a verse that we read earlier when speaking of only God can draw this creature down with a hook. Um, he, he mentions the godly frame of this creature in verse 12. Uh, verse 19, I've already mentioned that out of his mouth goes form flaming torches, fire, all this stuff. Verse 30, on the earth there is none his like, a creature without fear. His eyes see everything that is high. Hippos and alligators live on the ground or under the water. They're not, they're not high. And then he says, he is king over all the sons of pride. That seems odd that he's the king over all the sons of pride. And in verse four, I missed this one. It seems weird that you would make a covenant with a crocodile. God is asking Job, hey, this Leviathan thing, are you going to make a covenant with him? Is he going to speak soft words to you? Uh, again, you can make the argumentation that this is poetic language, uh, but it does seem odd that this person has a godly flame uh, frame. They speak, they speak fire. Um, you can make a covenant. You can't make a covenant with this thing. Again, that seems odd. Uh, and sons of pride. He's the king of the sons of pride. Michael, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it can go either way. I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. I don't think that the case can be decided on uh, on this portion of scripture. But uh, definitely agree with you, Josh. A, a strong case can be made that this is uh, sort of metaphorical ways of speaking about some sort of demonic entity. Maybe. At least potentially. Maybe. Yeah. Um, potentially. What's your boy, okay. boy Beal say? Oh, Beal. Well, uh, an important verse we got to read is Isaiah 27 1. It mentions oh, the yeah, Leviathan yeah, yeah. directly. Yeah. And uh, here's what it says. Now, this is in an eschatological context, uh, it's in a section of Isaiah that some people call Isaiah's mini apocalypse, Isaiah 24 through 27. Uh, so in chapter 26, he's just finished talking about how uh, basically the resurrection is going to happen, this massive like end times prophecy, okay? And then in verse 1, so we know it's talking about the last days. And it says, in that day, the Lord with his, uh, with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon in the sea. Okay, so Leviathan is mentioned, and it's promised that in the last days, the Lord will slay the Leviathan. So you asked what, what does my man Beal say he's talking about the scholar G.K. Beal. We've done an episode before with G.K. Beal about the New Testament usage of the Old Testament. You should go back and watch it. Uh, but I have Dr. Beal's commentary on Revelation, and uh, he makes a connection uh, with Isaiah 27 1 and the book of Revelation, specifically chapters 12 and 13. And what he says is that Isaiah 27, 1 is alluded to in Revelation 12, 3 and in Revelation 12, 9 in reference to the dragon who is the devil. And if you remember in Revelation chapter 12, the dragon is about to swallow the Christ child, but then the Christ child is caught up into heaven. And then in the next sequence, Michael the archangel is fighting with the dragon and the dragon is cast down and then persecutes the woman and her children. That whole sequence there. That feeds right in to Revelation chapter 13, where we have not a dragon, but a beast. And notably, the dragon is standing on the seashore, and it is summoning a beast from where? The sea, the waters of chaos. In fact, water imagery is prominent in Revelation. You have the sea of glass before the throne, because evil and chaos cannot stand before the throne, the sovereignty of Almighty God. But on the earth, there is still, during this age, in these last days, there are the waters of chaos. And so Satan sort of animates this beast and causes it to rise up. And uh, and if you remember, or if you've ever read it before, in Revelation 13, 3, it says that the beast, one of its head was slain. It suffered a mortal wound. And many people will, uh, especially futurists who see this as talking about the future, they'll say, well, the beast is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to, to die. But since the beast recovers from its wound, it's going to raise back to life. So there's going to be sort of the sort of death and resurrection and all kinds of different theories. Well, here's what Beale says about the beast and its wound, which later in the passage in verse 14, it's said to be wounded by a sword. 
Beale says this is a reference to Isaiah 27.1 and the Leviathan. Let me read. Um, he says, the wound comes from God because the Greek word for wound, uh, plague, is the word translated plague 11 times elsewhere in Revelation. In other words, this is divinely administered, this sword wound to the head of the beast always signifying something of divine origin. This wound on the beast's head is none other than that inflicted by Christ at his resurrection. and It is the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. He will crush or bruise you on the head. Mention of the sword that struck the beast's head in Revelation 13.14, listen to this, recalls the end-time prophecy of Isaiah 27.1. In that day, the Lord will punish Leviathan or, sea mo or the sea monster, the fleeing serpent with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, or the sea monster, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. And uh, and so, so the can point... I, it, can I ask a question yeah. real quick? So yes. G.K. Beale, one of the world's most famous and preeminent New Testament scholars and eschatology expert, says that the serpent and or the wounded head is a quote of Jesus defeating Leviathan? He is saying, yes. He is saying <laughs> yes. that Leviathan is the dragon, is the devil, animating the beast, which is the, I mean, depending on how you take the Antichrist or Antichrist Empire, Beale would interpret it broadly. But the, the point would be that just as, it, first of all, going back to Revelation 12, Beale would say that Michael casting the devil out of heaven and the dragon as suffering that initial defeat, that that initial defeat happened at Calvary. And he would say that the parallel to that is in Revelation 13, where the beast suffers initial defeat. So rather than being a future, you know, like death and resurrection of an antichrist, that it's actually looking backward to uh, to Calvary. So, so that Revelation 12 and 13 are in perfect parallel where one, you have a dragon suffering initial defeat, but going on to persecute. And then two, chapter 13, you have a beast suffering initial defeat and going on to persecute. This is actually my interpretation too. Uh, and so this is actually a past tense thing. The point for our purposes is number one, that Leviathan is demonic. It, Leviathan is demonic, okay? In fact, the devil himself. And that's what Beale would say. And uh, and that's what I would say, at least in this passage, okay? Um, so that's one, it is demonic. And number two, that this happened a long time ago when Christ defeated the devil initially, and then he will come again and defeat the devil finally. Okay, so our thoughts on this, I would say I'm leaning towards the idea that the Leviathan is a spiritual principality uh, of some kind, possibly, okay? I'm leaning towards that. If I, if I had to give you a percentage, I'd be like 75, 25, okay? I'm, I'm leaning in that direction, okay? And we got New Testament scholars that cite this. I think Dr. Michael Heiser leans this way. Uh, G.K. Beale leans this way. Uh, I mean, these aren't like two random dudes who have a YouTube channel. I mean, these guys are New Testament scholars. They're solid guys. So um, there's there's this idea. But unlike then, us, we're not unlike solid. Unlike us. Nah, we're, we know how to find the solid guys. I and mean, that's half the battle. <laughs> that's right. Anyway, um, and, and we present them to viewers like you. So uh, when it comes down to what this is and how we engage with it versus what charismatics, many charismatics are saying about this thing. So are some charismatics right that this is demonic in nature? It is a spiritual force? Yes. But here's the thing. They begin to ascribe certain spiritual attributes to this being, this entity, that the scriptures don't ascribe to it. Um, when we talk about powers and principalities and there's a bible verse that that looks like it's a demon like a python spirit we're gonna talk about that there's a there's a verse in the bible that seems as if it indicates that there's this spirit and in, in the word there is this python thing um are we going to ascribe certain characteristics and attribute certain um kinds of uh, nature to that thing that the bible doesn't explicitly say so that we can kind of create some kind of divine hierarchical cosmology no, that only encourages speculation. When we engage with principalities and powers, how do we do that? We preach the gospel. Uh, in the gospels, Jesus sends out the 72 and they're preaching uh, out, out and about. And then he says he saw Satan fall like lightning as 
many interpreters will say that this comes down to as the, the gospel is going forth, uh, the, the principalities are being dethroned and they fall down to the earth as Christ reigns authoritatively over the geographical regions where the gospel has spread. So how do we wrestle uh, against demonic powers in the heavenly places? We preach the gospel. If there's a demon inside of a person, you cast the demon out. We've talked about this. We've got episodes on this. Uh, and there's real kind of engagement with spiritual warfare when there's a demon right in front of you. But this idea that you're going to go into the courts of heaven, you're going to align yourself with seven mystical voices, you're going to open up secret books uh, like Robert Henderson teaches in the courts of heaven, these kind of Gnostic teachings that are nowhere in the scriptures, nowhere in church history, and you're going to wrestle with these spiritual principalities in the heavenly places that Jesus didn't wrestle with, that the apostles Apostles didn't wrestle with, that none of the prophets wrestled with in all of the Old Testament. And you're going to somehow, I bind you, spirit of Jezebel, oh, uh, you know, off of the, the region of, of uh, where's Vegas. I cast you down in Jesus' name. The Bible says if you did that to a person and they didn't repent, seven more evil would come back. So why on earth do we think that we can have authority over some kind of geographical spirit if not the entire geographical region got saved? Let's stick to what the Bible says. Let's preach the gospel. If there's a demon in front of us, let's cast it out. Let's not get into all the mythical weirdness. And we've got some clips. Michael, do you want to listen to some clips or do you have something to tail in on the heels of that? Yeah, you got I was something looking to say. for the uh, question. I just want to keep defining our terms because sometimes people get confused when, when we use these words. Uh, Lori Elise, but I can't find it, had a question. What is a principality? And uh, a principality, it is a demonic being, but not so much like a personal being that, you know, torments somebody and gives them scoliosis or something, but uh, more of an overarching uh, being, sort of like what we see in Daniel chapter 10, where you had the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, and these were demonic entities manipulating an actual king of Persia and king of Greece down below, and uh, or really their entire nations. And so, uh, and so they're, they're demonic entities. So when Paul lists this out in Ephesians 6, 12, we, we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, ruler, authority, principality. It falls into that category of these demonic beings that are manipulating governments and cultures. And so there is an entire hierarchy within the demonic realm, as there is in the angelic realm. There are archangels uh, like Michael, Gabriel, but there are also just angels messenger spirits and uh and so uh, there is a hierarchy but we don't want to go beyond what the scripture says and josh that's where we really want to go with these clips is we want to explore now that we've looked at the text let's look directly at some of the uh the charismatic teachings and let's try to discern remembering these are our brothers and sisters in christ uh we believe as far as we know that we're watching our brothers and sisters in christ but we just want to discern is what they're saying lining up with scripture or does it go beyond the scripture? Is it making claims uh, about demonic hierarchies that are just a little bit more than what we can definitively claim? So yeah, we've let's got watch the first one. We've got, we've got two clips for you guys today. Let's start with this first one right here. Yeah, I, I really love talking about this spirit because that's really what needs to happen with Leviathan, Patricia, because Leviathan is a demonic king and it needs to be exposed. It's a high level demonic spirit, but it's really, really subtle. You know, we hear things like high level demonic spirit and we think it's going to be so easy to identify. It's so very subtle. And the key with Leviathan, as you said, we, we were almost forced into a study on it because we had a, this massive outbreak. And when we went to the Lord, the Lord said that Leviathan was being released globally into the earth. God himself is speaking to Job and is going to describe the spirit of Leviathan. God asked Job these questions concerning Leviathan. He starts out by saying, can you catch Leviathan with a hook? Can you put a, a, a noose around its jaw? Can you tie with a rope through its nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg for mercy or will it beg you for pity? God is describing the spirit of Leviathan. In, in other words, God is telling Job, Job, you cannot deal with this in the natural realm. You can't hook it with a fish's hook. You can't catch this thing in a net. You can't catch him with a hook. This is something that is spiritual, Job. And this is something that must be dealt with in the spiritual realm. Friends, it's Ryan Lestranger with the Monday word. And my Monday word for you is 
is the Leviathan spirit will lift you to break you. You know, the Leviathan spirit, I call the Leviathan spirit the king of pride. The assignment of that spirit is to sow seeds in your life, seeds in the lives of people of pride, to lift you up, to break you down. And the Leviathan spirit loves to lift business people up to break them down, lift preachers up to break them down, lift leaders up to break them down. The Leviathan spirit doesn't like humility. It despises humility. And you know, I found out you can't get in the glory of God without humility. You can't be in the presence of God without humility. The Lord said, if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he, the Lord, will exalt you in due time. But the Leviathan demon lifts itself up. Leviathan preachers talk about themselves all the time. They preach about themselves. Leviathan leaders serve themselves before they serve and take care of others. Psalms 104.26 talks about this. Remember, we're going to give you over 60 verses tonight. But Psalms 104.26 talks about it, and it says, there go the ships and Leviathan, which you form to plane it. So Psalms is talking about ships, and then Leviathan is swimming by the ships. Leviathan is a, write this down, a marine spirit. Tonight, we're not going to go into depth on all the different marine spirits. We'll do that on another day. But just know that Leviathan is a water spirit or is a uh, marine spirit. Leviathan was known as an ocean dwelling creature. One of his main goals, the spirit of Leviathan, as we're starting this, and we're just, we're just warming up here, is to cause you to shipwreck. He wants to shipwreck your ministry. Am I preaching to anybody tonight? He wants to shipwreck your marriage. He wants to shipwreck your prayer life. He wants to shipwreck your faith. You have to understand the spirit of Leviathan is a shipwrecking spirit. It's a marriage ruining spirit. It's a friendship breaking spirit. It's a ministry destroying spirit okay so lots of stuff there i mean there's some stuff we agree with some stuff that we don't you'll notice i've used a lot of clips from isaiah and the reason i used a lot of clips from isaiah uh, salvador is because he actually engages with texts of scripture and uh it's worthy of mentioning a lot of those guys and a lot of those clips didn't really engage with scripture they kind of spoke authoritatively as in i've encountered this thing and uh this is what i've learned from it i've got a quote here at the end that's that's pretty upsetting um but but it kind of falls in line with this question from a viewer after watching this he says i don't agree with gnosticism at all however it's interesting uh, uh idea uh, to think that we cannot learn certain characteristics of certain demons if we encounter them in ministry frequently well that's a that's a great point uh, but but i would just suggest that if you're a coming encounter with a demon and you're learning information from that demon um it, it it's probably not true right like demons are liars they're deceivers they're coming to spread false doctrine that's what the bible talks about right. so if you're encountering demonic forces uh, and a lot of these guys are saying this is what this demon is this is what this demon is this is what this demon is um but but you're learning it from the demon you're probably not learning something that is true uh, everything yeah. necessary for a spiritual life is found in the scriptures so i'm going to offer you a little bit of pushback josh okay, okay? some somebody says to you well, well, Josh, Jesus says to a demon, what is your name? And the demon says, Legion. Mm -hmm. So apparently that was true, right? The demon told the truth in that instance. Would you say? I mean, I would say that they are speaking to Jesus. Um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> as earlier okay, stated, well, as earlier stated. The Jesus in me. As earlier well, stated so, in this. So Josh, let me ask you this. What would you say, let's say you're casting out a demon and... And, and let's say it's a real hairy situation, okay? And you're like, man, I, I got to go for it here. You say, demon, what is your name? And the demon says, Leviathan. Are you going to say, Leviathan spirit, go in the name of Jesus? Or are you going to say, like, just go in the name of Jesus? Are you going to, like, treat it as though I don't believe, the truth? I don't believe in, like, the kind of first century um, wacky... Um, if I know the entity's name, I can control it. Uh, that's kind of a witchcraft thinking, uh, that if I know the spirit's name, then I can control that spirit. When Jesus asks this you know, demon its name, he finds out that there's a lot of demons in this person. Uh, you know, he found out, okay, it's at least, I think, plausible he's casting out a single demon at a time, and there's tons of demons present. And then he tells all of them to leave, and then they ask permission to go into the pigs. Again, I think that th this is a completely different criteria. Um, if, let's just say, let me ask this question in response to you, Michael. Let's say you've been doing deliverance ministry for 15 years. And every time that you deliver, do deliverance ministry, another demon with a different name pops itself up. Are you going to record all of the names of these demons, pass them on to your disciples and tell them how you got your demon that was named to this so that when they encounter that demon, they can scroll through the Michael uh, Roundtree deliverance handbook, find the demon name and, and follow what you followed to cast the demon out? No, no, I'm not going to do that. But a lot of people actually do do that. Do that. I mean, yes. I, 
<laughs> I've, I've heard of, of ministries who do that very thing. And that's where I, I get, I mean, if a demon told me its name was, I mean, one time a demon told me its name was Azazel and I was like, Azazel go in the name of Jesus. And, uh, you know, so I might, I might address it. If a demon said, my name is Leviathan, I would probably say Leviathan go in the name. I don't think it's going to hurt anything and it might help something. Um, because, uh, I don't know, maybe this demon is bound by the authority of Jesus to tell me the truth. On the other hand, I agree with you. Demons are liars. And a lot of times, I mean, I've been casting out demons where they say, where the person will say vile things and mocking things. So I, I don't want to take everything this demon says is gospel, right? Because it's a lie, you know, it's a liar, like you said. So I, I, I just thought but I would put it out there. And I, but I think where what you're touching on, Josh, is the fact that what is happening here when, when we say things like uh, Leviathan is the king of pride, it sows seeds of pride, it despises humility, it's a marine spirit that shipwrecks your faith, it's a high level king spirit, it's released globally, etc. So much of this is not rooted in the scripture, but somebody's experience. They come across, well, we just think that this uh, this is a proud spirit. Maybe they were casting out a demon sometime. Uh, I mean, I'm just ascertaining this. I don't know for sure. Well, here's, or, here. or maybe they're just looking at it and they're saying, well, it came from the water in the scripture. So it's a marine spirit. And but, but a marine spirit, what, what is that? This is a, a category we don't find in scripture. We don't find a marine spirit spirit and scripture. So I no, know. I would just say that there are entire groups of charismatics that are trying to counsel demons, that they want to talk to the demon. They sit the person down and they have the demon come up and they just talk to the demon and they ask, they're trying to, um, syncretistically like, like, like mend the personalities in some kind of like split personality psychology sort of thing where they're trying to integrate the demon. That was the word I was looking for into the person's psyche by asking them questions. Well, what do you do? Uh, can you repent? They lead the demon in salvation. Like uh, things like this, it's, it's absurd, but these things came from people finding out information from a demon. Like, how, well, how did you get in? And, 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 and how, how, how do I have authority over you? And, and what's going on here? And they learn things from the demonic and they create these kinds of systems. I mean, Jesus told demons to go, leave, right? If, if a spirit mm -hmm. says, hey, my name's Leviathan, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, okay, get out of here, Leviathan. But I have nothing, no reason to think that you cannot use that name as well and say, get out of your spirit and it be gone. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that you have to exert a name. Right. It's not like the demon's authority. like sitting inside of somebody being like, ha ha, they didn't say my name. I get to say. <laughs> my right? name's Rumble like... He didn't say my name. <laughs> okay <laughs> okay let's engage with some of these charismatic De clips demon impersonations have now happened on remnant radio today let's go with clip number two. Oh, wait a second wait a second we haven't engaged with any of this stuff okay so robert hodgkin says leviathan is a high level king spirit now he's probably pulling from that passage in isaiah uh, that says that there's this king dragon so maybe he's saying that it's like a ruling principality leviathan is being released globally now that's again you know do I have to take his word for that? Has it always been released globally? I, I don't know, but where is he getting this information? He doesn't tell us. He, he got it from some kind of vision. Um, you know, Isaiah, I don't think he said anything uh, that I disagree with. He did explicitly say that he's speaking to Job, and it's clearly a spirit. He's saying, Job, this spirit. I don't know that it's that clear that it's a spirit. In fact, tons, if not most commentators seem to say it's not a spirit in Job. Um, now, here's the thing about Isaiah. I like Isaiah. I watched that whole clip, uh, and every time I listen to Isaiah, I hear him preach repentance. I hear him preach faith. I actually have a lot of respect and admiration for that guy. A good guy. I think that when it comes to this subject of demonology, my approach to scripture and his are very different. I think in the next set of clips, you'll see some quotes from Isaiah that I think he jumps to. Well, the Hebrew word here means this. Therefore, this is what that spirit does. And I think he jumps to a conclusion that I wouldn't do. Uh, but again, uh, I think that he comes from a different cloth than some of these other guys that we're listening hey, to. Yeah. Hey, Josh, before we play that clip, I want to respond to April Fierce family, G2G. Okay. Okay, she says, okay, so I'm confused. You guys do deliverance, but you have an issue of what and how other people talk and preach about them. Okay, great question, April. Um, yes, yeah, so here's the thing. At Rimna Radio, we call balls and strikes. You, you almost expect somebody to be all like, 
in favor of everything, all charismaticness, all charismania, it's all good. Or on the other side, all discernment ministry, where everything's terrible. Basically, God's not doing anything today anymore. He did stuff way back then, and now, you know, he just saves people, and that's about it. Um, <laughs> okay, big exaggeration, sorry, but you with me. But there's <laughs> actually like... Man. The biggest straw man ever. I'm sorry. I love my cessationist brothers. I know you don't think that way. Okay, but here's the point. There there actually is a way to say, you know what? Like, I believe in the stuff. Let's go cast out demons. Let's heal the sick. Let's prophesy. Let's train people to do these things and raise up oh, yeah. churches to do these things and stick to the word of God and yeah. not speculate about things that we can't claim. And Jack Deere is the one who taught me how to teach the Bible, and he said, there's no use speculating about things that we don't know in the Scripture as part of your teaching, because there's so much clear to just teach and to lay out there and exhort people in that when you get into the realm of speculation, you're almost certain to say something wrong. So that's just a rule that I stick by. I think that's good exposition, and I think that we just need to when it comes to teaching the Bible, teach the Bible and not make speculations about what this may mean. Because then we set ourselves up to be this expert based on speculation. So people have to say, oh, okay, well, here's why my marriage is bad. It's, it's not because I mistreat my husband or it's not because I need to, you know, we need to go on more dates. It's, it's because he's got a Leviathan spirit. And you know, I just, I want to avoid the silliness based on speculation. That's it. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, so like Ryan Lestrange that he's the king of pride, right? And he seeds pride in people, right? That's, yeah. But like, can you name a demon that doesn't have pride? Like we were talking about spiritual beings that have rebelled against the God creator of the universe who has all power. Like how much more pride do you need? Like all demons have pride, right? Um, so he, uh, Ryan Lestrange says he despises humility. What demon likes humility? I don't know. Uh, so he said, talks about Leviathan preachers and teachers. Are we talking about preachers who are influenced by this spirit? Um, and, and can't we just say that there are preachers who are vain? Christian brothers who we love, who preach the gospel, but they wrestle in sin of vanity. Um, it, it's wrong. They shouldn't do it. But aren't these more likely our sins than a sin of a demonic spirit? We have a guy who preaches the gospel, who loves his wife and kids, but because he's vain and talks about himself a lot, he's got a Leviathan spirit? That's a jump for me. Um, it, uh, Isaiah says Leviathan is a marine spirit. Again, that's a jump because of the chaos imagery. We know what the chaos imagery means, um, but, but to say that he's a, a marine spirit, what does that do? How does that inform us? How does that help us? A Leviathan wants to shipwreck your faith. Well, if he's a, a sea creature who wrecks ships, right? Well, well, then he must be trying to shipwreck your faith. But see, what that is, is that's looking at an image of the Old Testament and the chaos imagery there, and then finding a verse in the New Testament about shipwreck, okay? That's like, it's not the way that we do exegesis. We can't just find a verse over here and assume that this New Testament verse way over here is talking yeah. about the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, every demon wants to shipwreck your faith. So uh, I don't think that there's a single Which demon, demon like, doesn't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. Let, me help you, uh, let me help you in your faith here, buddy. So let's watch clip number two. You ready for clip number two, Michael? Yep. Let's do it. And its main purposes are to twist communication, create misunderstanding and misinterpretation. But really what it's after is relationships. It wants to come against relationship. It wants to come against alliances. It wants to come against unity because the enemy knows we're stronger together than apart. And the enemy knows how powerful we are, one, united with God, but then especially united with each other. So that's why we're seeing this spirit running rampant in the earth, in the church, because the, everywhere you look, there's so much division. There's so much dissension. There's so much anger and bitterness and offense. We were talking before we went live how for so many people, whether it's in government or in media, nobody has a conversation anymore. It's just people misunderstanding, misinterpreting and attacking one another. This isn't happening by chance. And it's not just because people are in a bad mood. It's not just politics. It's actually a, a spirit that's been released globally with the assignment of bringing dissension unto division. As number one, write this down. The first characteristic is Leviathan twist the truth. Leviathan twists, that's twists the truth. Leviathan's name in Hebrew literally 
means twisted. It means the twisted serpent. And this is Leviathan's primary function is to twist words. Leviathan, the way that he works in people and churches is he twists conversations. Leviathan twists intentions. Leviathan is a manipulating spirit. Isaiah 27, one says, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the twisted serpent, the dragon that lives in the sea. Um, now let's talk about some of the signs that you could know if Leviathan is operating. Um, let's go into what first thing talk about. Um, oh yeah, let's go back into Job 41. Okay. Um, if you go to Job 41, 22, it says, Strength dwells in his neck, and sorrow dances before him. Um, this sounds weird, I'm going to say, but I'm just going to say it for those of you who have understanding. Um, sometimes I'll feel Leviathan if I'm becoming prideful about something, like, in my neck. Um, so I'll just say that. And sorrow dances before him. If you're experiencing a lot of sorrow in your life, like, might have something to do with pride because prideful people cause a lot of mess. I'm number two. Leviathan is a covenant breaker. Write that down. Number two is Leviathan is a covenant breaker. And I'm going to give you verses for every single attribute and characteristic of Leviathan. So don't stress. Don't panic. I'm going to give you a verse. That's found in Job 41.4. Says he will, this is God asking Job the question. He says, will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? In other words, God is sarcastically telling Job, Leviathan is not going to come in agreement with you. He's not going to make a covenant with you. Why? Because Leviathan is a covenant breaking spirit. I was saying this was happening with us, some friends of ours. We realized that Leviathan was getting between our communication. Like, so I was saying one thing and I knew what I said, but they swore they heard something different. They said, oh, you did not say that to me. And so Leviathan is a twisting spirit. This is Leviathan's primary function is to twist words. Leviathan, the way that he works in people and churches is he twists conversations. Leviathan twists intentions. Leviathan is a manipulating spirit. Isaiah 27, one says, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the twisted serpent, the dragon that lives in the sea. And so Leviathan is a twisting spirit. This is what Isaiah is describing him as. And something very interesting about the root word for the Hebrew word snake is that the Hebrew word or the primitive root word for snake literally translate to whisper a magic spell that is the root primitive word of the word serpent which the bible calls leviathan it's to whisper a magic spell but i'm here to tell you today that there's these sea monsters these sea demons these marine spirits that are roaming about in the ocean like a see it's in the spirit realm so it's just you're like well i just won't go in the water and i'm saying no it doesn't work that way they're roaming around in the in, in the in the sea but they're releasing witchcraft they're really they're like principalities some of them principalities that rule over territories they're territorial demons especially leviathan Detect the twisted lies of the Leviathan spirit. In my book, I teach you how to prophetically recognize these spirits. Okay, a couple things in that clip that we got to go through. Um, uh, the, the people on that clip were Robert Hotchkin, uh, uh, Isaiah, we've talked about him already, uh, Kay Nash, Cindy Jacobs, and Jennifer Lecrae. So those are the names I see some of you asking. Uh, someone else in the comment section said, hey, let's be careful not to mock. I agree. If anyone in the comment section is mocking or scoffing, don't do that, right? Uh, we want to engage with the arguments. We want to think carefully about these things, and we want to say, hey, we disagree. But disagreement's not scoffing. Disagreement's not hate. Uh, disagreement isn't undermining someone's ministry. Or uh, We're just saying, I think you're making a theological point here, and we disagree. So, uh, Michael, do you, do you have anything in particular that, that stood out to you in that video? Mike's muted. My bad. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just feel like the whole thing, uh, you know, one of them was talking about a marine spirit, and she said that it's literally over the ocean, and this is taking the symbol of the sea and evil and chaos and turning it into a literal thing as though... Uh, it, and it and it starts to get a little confusing. Hold on, is Leviathan hanging out somewhere over the Pacific Ocean, or is Leviathan, like say Cindy Jacobs says, disrupting communication between individuals? It feels like it, so. On one hand, it's like this real personal spirit. On other hand, it's the very territorial spirit. People saying very different things. Well, why are they saying such different things? Because the the scripture doesn't give us clarity about, I mean, if there is a Leviathan spirit and if there is what it actually does. And um, the fact that there's twisting associated with this spirit, does that automatically mean that what the Leviathan spirit does is twist communication? I don't think that's what the text was teaching the original author or no. original audience. I don't think anyone in the original audience would have taken it that way. Uh, I think we have to jump to a lot of conclusions to get there. Same with Leviathan is a covenant breaker. 
was this what God was trying to teach Job? Like, hey, Job, Leviathan is a covenant breaker. No, he's saying, Job, I made a covenant. You, you know, you and I had a covenant. Um, you know, Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to sin against you. So there's this partnership and relationship between Yahweh and Job. But there's uh, not, uh, God saying, you can't have a relationship with Leviathan. You just can't. You can't and, and so... Yeah, I, I don't see anything they're teaching directly in any way or really even indirectly that uh, there's a, such a thing as a Leviathan spirit and that Leviathan spirit is a uh, a covenant breaker. I don't know where they get it, it releases witchcraft. Uh, I don't know where they get, um, you know, somebody says, you know, sometimes I feel oh, man, in my that neck one's rough. when yeah. they're is a Leviathan spirit. Okay, well, I'll let you speak into that because I hit most of these. Well, Why did that one rub you the said, wrong way, Josh? Well, because they were quoting that verse in Job where it says that Leviathan has strength in his neck. I mean, it's describing a snake, right? So like a snake is basically one giant neck. Like it's the only muscle it has, right? Um, and again, they described it as this coiling thing. That's what snakes do. Mm -hmm. The snake's coil. It's describing a snake. It's not trying to give you a spiritual attribute of this thing twisting around you it's just a snake that's what snakes do so so when yeah. nash says or it's got strength or maybe in its even neck, this josh maybe even this like <laughs> if if that's your interpretation because I, I mean we would say that is a leap and such a leap that we would say I, we just simply don't think that's true however like i mean hey people have different interpretations let's say that actually is your interpretation say you know what i think this can be interpreted this way I mean, at least get put a little space between your interpretation and blanket assertions of truth. That's that's my thing. Is that we're just so dogmatic that this well, is definitely the way it is, and I feel as though it puts Christians in this place where it's like I have to know about the Leviathan spirit so I can have victory over the devil, and or I mean over the Leviathan spirit. And I, I just. I just think that it puts Christians into a place of, of feeling perpetually defeated because now we have to have all the secret knowledge that no one can really get from the scripture. Yeah, that's right. And and so with let me finish with Kay Nash real quick. Kay, Kay made a statement sure. where she said, for those who can hear, right? So like, if you don't understand what I'm saying or disagree with what I'm saying, you're like, you must not be spiritual. Like that, that is a statement that you're making that you know your statement that you're about to say is pretty shallow theologically. Like the text does not explicitly say that, but there's a neck mentioned and that you think that there's a demonic spirit mentioned. Therefore, you feel it in your neck when there's a demon around. Uh, that is a real misuse of scripture. We shouldn't do that. Uh, again, Isaiah, great guy, love the guy to death. It says he twists the truth because it means twisted serpent. Well, yeah, that's a descriptor of serpent. He says Leviathan is a covenant breaker. Well, yeah, you can't make a covenant. It didn't say that he breaks covenants. He says he won't make a covenant. That's, again, reading something into the text that's not there. Uh, Jacob's, people will misunderstand what you said. Uh, again, um, it talks about pride, but but what do you? where is this idea? It, it, again, it comes from this idea of twisting. The twisting. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Isaiah says uh, the serpent uh, means to whisper magic spells. I think that might be what you were mentioning earlier. Like, when, what, why does this person get magic authority? Um, you know, I want to read a quote. Um, I, I don't have it pulled up. Let me let me read a quote from Lecrae. I, I went through her book, uh, Leclaire. I'm sorry, Jennifer Leclaire. Um, I was I, like, sweet. Lecrae talks about the oh, Leviathan man. spirit. Lecrae, come on. Dude, and that it would rhymes. Be a great, dude, that would be a great rap. I would love to have him on the show, by the way. Lecrae. Um, if you are watching this, will you please make a rap about the Leviathan spirit? Or Remnant Radio, or both. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so here, here our, goes. Our intro music will instantly change if he ever does that. 1,000%. <laughs> uh, I used to think the same thing. In fact, I was taught that Jezebel, uh, witchcraft, and religion were all the three, the three main spiritual forces. Um, uh, besides fear, demons, and voices of rejection, those three uh, spiritual warfare rock stars, those were the, sp the three spiritual warfare rock stars in my mind, uh, were responsible for uh, wrecking most of the havoc in the earth today. Although I thought at the time I was well equipped, I was ignorant of many of the devil's devices. Of course, I'm still learning. We all are. I find uh, it haughtily foolish to proclaim anyone is an expert in the specific in in any specific demonic field. Uh, there there are leading voices in spiritual warfare teaching movement as well as uh, emerging voices that are generals in the battlefield. 
but we are all learning and growing. And my experience with the water spirits, even while writing this book, re uh, reminded me of that reality. When I was hyper-focused on Jezebel, witchcraft, and religion, uh, I had never heard of such thing as a python spirit, much less uh, a behemoth. I never considered that there was, uh, as the late spiritual warfare teacher Derek Prince called uh, them, persons without bodies dwelling beneath the surface of the sea, uh, raven, ravens, uh, lakes, rivers, streams, and other uh, waters around the world. Uh, as I matured in the Lord and spent time around seasoned, battle-tested warriors who taught me uh, the importance of spiritual discernment, I learned that there are many unseen forces in the spiritual world, some that roam the earth like roaring lions and some that call the waters their domain. So in this little section that Jennifer um, has put together in her book, um, she attributes her knowledge of these things to other teachers, other people who've had experience mm -hmm. uh, engaging with demonic forces. Um, and again, I just really want to encourage our viewers, if you haven't heard this from the scriptures, and explicitly in the scriptures, we need to be careful because again, the scriptures are sufficient uh, for everything, uh, for our life in practice, in teaching and doctrine, all of that can be found in scripture. Someone earlier in the chat asked something like, well, if you believe in the word of knowledge and you believe in prophecy, by the way, I don't, uh, his words, not mine. He said, why wouldn't you believe a demonic spirit? Well, we believe that everything uh, for doctrine and life and practice is sufficiently found in the scriptures. Uh, yep. Insight uh, from the Holy Spirit saying, hey, go do this thing or go do that thing is not a doctrine binding on the conscience for all people everywhere. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 29 tells us to weigh and test prophecy. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians 14, the, the, the latter verses, I believe it's in verse 37, the Apostle Paul tells us that those who are spiritual, those who are prophets, Prophets, they should listen to me for the words that I write are the very words of God. So test the prophet's words, but my words are inspired scripture. So he even put the first century church's prophetic word in a different authoritative category as his written word as an apostle. So uh, we should do that to this day. Uh, if we're going to test prophecy and we're going to test these things, you can't just get prophetic downloads on how to wrestle with these spirits and write books about it. Uh, that is not authoritative. Uh, that has to come from apostolic doctrine. Yeah, um, yeah, Josh, I, I want to hop in here because, uh, you know, there are some people in the chat saying, well, like, hey, the word of God doesn't explain just everything in the world. And there are some things that we know by revelation. And there are some things that we know uh, by experience, etc. And and he, here's the thing. Yes, you know, the Bible's not going to tell me much about the periodic table of elements, right? But that's not what the, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture teaches. The doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture teaches, and, and this is why this is my problem with this, and this is why uh, we actually will, will passionately oppose what we believe is this hyper-speculation. It's not just like, hey, we have a little disagreement. Uh, we consider this a really big deal because of the doctrine of sufficiency of scripture that teaches that the scriptures give us everything that we need for godliness and salvation. And there are some charismatic teachers that say, well, the scriptures teach you a whole lot, but you also need to understand the Leviathan spirit and the Python spirit and the Rahab spirit and the this and that spirit. You got to understand the hierarchy. I mean, that quote that you just read, Josh, was like, hey, I used to struggle with all this. But then these people told me new things that weren't in the Bible, but they taught me new things that I didn't know before because they were battle tested warriors. And and Here's a great verse for sufficiency of Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There is not a good work that God calls you to do that the scriptures don't give you enough information for. You say, well, but you believe in prophecy and there's revelation that's outside the scripture. Yes, but the scripture teaches us to prophesy. And so that fits within the sufficiency of scripture. But the scripture never says, hey, if you want to get rid of a demon, 
you have to understand secret demonology that only these battle-tested warriors know. You see, that enters into the realm of secret knowledge that goes beyond the scripture, what Josh called Gnostic, Gnostic coming from the Greek word for knowledge. That's what we're concerned about. We're not calling these people Gnostics no. by any stretch. We're calling them brothers and sisters, beloved in Christ. But what we are saying is it trends towards something that can be dangerous if we don't say anything about it. Yeah, it's certainly speculative. Okay, so we at the point of the show, we've got to wrap up. Here are my closing thoughts. There are really demons out there. Uh, they can really tempt you and bind you in all kinds of sin. Any of them. All of them. Uh, uh, that does not mean that we need to create some kind of divine cosmology of angelics, uh, angels and demons and some kind of hierarchy where we assign arbitrary names and specific kinds of uh, demons uh, and list their specific abilities, uh, like we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and number four, uh, demonic cosmology uh, like this only serves to magnify speculation, uh, creates charismatic mythology, uh, and an over-reliance on prophetic voices over biblical authority. Uh, so again, are there demons today? Yes. Uh, after the cross, uh, the demons didn't go away. Uh, they were in the New Testament. They're all over the Bible. Uh, do we still wrestle with them? Absolutely, we do. Do we have authority over them? Absolutely, we do. Why do we need to know what they can do? What are their superpowers? It's irrelevant. You confront a demon. You preach the gospel. Uh, you have the person who is possessed repent and believe in Jesus, and you cast the demon out the end. Uh, if you want more information on casting out devils, uh, there's an entire playlist where we've talked about these things. We believe in it, we practice it, uh, but we've got to be careful of speculation. And I say this because this idea of speculation bleeds into tons of charismatic theology. So if you hear me and Michael being really passionate about this, it's because we've seen where it goes. Uh, maybe check out our Courts of Heaven video if you don't believe us. Uh, Mikey, got anything, anything else? Any closing thoughts? That's it. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Share this video. Get the, Michael get looks the like he woke up there. early. He looks tired. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, what? Uh, uh, you look, look tired, tired? buddy. You, look, you Dude, look like you should I, have had some caffeine. I genetically, I, I have bags under my eyes genetically, and I feel like you just made fun of me. Wow. Thanks, bro. Someone's a victim. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and without <laughs> further ado, uh, I want to remind you guys that we have a free ebook in the description of the video if you're interested in learning how to hear the voice of God. We've got an ebook that talks about the different ways that God communicates. Uh, Job tells us that uh, God speaks your way and their way, though man may not perceive it. So there's tons of ways that God speaks, and sometimes we don't hear it. If you liked this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Maybe hit subscribe. And do us a favor. If you liked our content, you like the stuff we're cranking out, maybe share it with a friend. Uh, say, hey, friend, watch this stuff. Because if not, you won't have secret knowledge like I have. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. We're entirely crowdfunded. Links in the description if you would like to give. Blessings. Have a great day.